Hi, my name is Sergio Salgado, and I'm part of a team called Open Sci Ed that provides freely available, high quality science instructional materials. We spoke with astronomers from around the world to get their perspectives on the relationship between the Earth and the sky. What we learned was fascinating, and we are excited to share their stories with you. We hope these stories get you thinking about how patterns in the sky set the rhythm for your life, your community, and all life on Earth. Totem, it's, it's your connection to generally an ancestor being. You have a totem for your nation, you have a totem for your family, and you also have your own personal totem. You get them from elders, and generally you have to go through initiation rites to get your own totem. We see animals as being our kin, so being our family, and so we have an obligation to take care of them, to make sure that they're safe and they're cared for. That was Jesse Ferrari Thomas, an Indigenous scholar in Australia who is currently an undergraduate student pursuing studies in ecology, genetics, and the Indigenous practice of fire sticking. Jesse works with cultural astronomers in Australia to draw connections between Indigenous star knowledge and ecology. We sat down with Jesse to find out more about Jesse's relationship with the sky and how the people in Jesse's community have connected to the sky over generations. I'm a trans and gender fluid First Nations person. My tribe's nations are the Yoda Yoda and Bangarang people, who are a Koori people of northeastern Victoria, so on the border of New South Wales. I study ecology and I'm hoping to, in particular, work around conservation. I'm really looking to come at it from an angle of an Indigenous person and our knowledge systems and how intimately we know animals, especially our totem animals, and how we can start to engage with Western science. When we say science, we have an image in our head of what that means. And that image comes from Western European history. But knowledge about the natural world was not invented by Europeans like Galileo and Newton. For thousands of years, People around the world have been observing the sky, collecting knowledge about the sky, testing their ideas, and using stories to transmit those ideas to the next generation. With Indigenous science, it's, it's very much all knowledge systems are heavily linked and we don't tend to distinguish them compared to Western science. And it's still based on observation and inferences, and you would do experiments. One example Jesse gave of the way indigenous systems of knowledge are interwoven was the connection between totems and the sky. A lot of the stars are also linked in to totems, and we see quite a few of them as spiritual ancestors. For example, we have a star, Canopus, which represents one of our turtles, um, Baedera Bajera which is the short neck Maya River turtle. They represent, and their placement in the sky can mean when they're starting to breed and when they're starting to kind of emerge from burrows and they start to be more active and that sort of thing. A lot of, a lot of our knowledge is heavily linked in with the stars and our totems as well. And so we, we see the behavior of animals reflected in the heavens and vice versa. Jesse told us that the Aboriginal flag is a symbol that reflects their close relationship between Earth and sky. The black represents the Aboriginal people of Australia, so it represents our race and us as people. Red represents the red earth, so it represents the red ochre that's very sacred to our people, that's used in many, many ceremonies, and Aboriginal people's continual spiritual relation to the land. The yellow represents the sun, it's the giver of life and it's our protector. We all see it as being a giver of life and a, and a light in the sky and a beacon offering us warmth and protection. Jesse lives in Australia, which is in the Southern Hemisphere. That means the weather in Australia is warm when we experience cold weather and cooler when we feel the hottest temperatures of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Generally from the onset of September all the way to Late Feb is when you'll get hot, warm, hot climate. We might call the time of year when the climate is hot, summer. 
but Jesse told us that the four seasons we are familiar with are not universal. For Jesse's communities, there are many more seasons than the four we are familiar with in our culture. Jesse shared how the stars in the sky help to mark the arrival of those seasons. We observe and keep track of the movement of stars in our sky by looking at the placement at certain points and it helps us tell what seasons are coming, what weather to expect. So you have around about eight seasons and they're all to do not necessarily with just the temperature and the climate, but also with the behavior of different animals and the coming of different plants and the behavior of stars in the sky. So different constellations coming in and out, moving at different points in, in the sky or depends on their brightness as well. We do have this one season among the Wurundjeri called the Waring or Wombat season. This is around April, July. Wombats, you'll start to see emerge from their burrows to busk, which is like go around grazing and that sort of thing um, and graze in the sunshine. And you'll also start to hear the mating courtship displays and calls of the bullen bullen, which is the Wurundjeri word for superb lyrebird. During the season, interestingly, the constellation of Sagittarius rises in the southeast after sunset, indicating the midpoint of cold weather. So when it rises in the southeast, you can tell that cold weather is coming about. And so that's that connection to the sky, but also to behavior of the animals and the coming of food sources. Jesse tells us that a lot of indigenous knowledge was lost due to colonization and government forcing indigenous communities to integrate into their culture to purposefully stop certain knowledge. The early policies that really contributed to the loss of language and even culture were the moving of people onto missions and also the theft of children. It's what we call the stolen generation. Children were taken from their parents and people were punished for practicing their cultures. I myself am coming to learn more about my culture and engaging more of it. My family are from the stolen generations, so I'm reclaiming a lot of that knowledge myself. Along with lost indigenous knowledge, Jesse tells us how the rhythms of the earth and the sky have been broken over time due to various changes in the environment. We have what you call the common brown butterfly. They start to really merge during the bitter up season or the dry season, so January, February. You start to see the females flying around looking for male butterflies. We're noticing that their population is declining. We're seeing a lot less of that mating going on. And so that means that a lot of bats and birds that rely upon them at first food source end up having to either migrate further out or starve or they have to find some other food source to adapt to. So it has really tangible and disastrous effects in the food web. And we can tell that they should be breeding at this point in time by the constellations in the sky, so midpoint. I think it's Canopus when it's due east at sunset. That's when it should be around about the time that the common brown butterfly females start looking for mates. But we're seeing less of them around and less of them engaging in that. So it's very, very extremely worrying. We asked how Jesse's community has been able to reclaim some of the lost knowledge and connections between the rhythms of earth and sky. We're very much stargazing people, so we, we definitely look to the stars in general to tell us the time and, and give us signs. The Southern Cross is one that's used to tell whether the days are going to be longer or not, what we can expect in terms of length of the day. Because we don't have hours, so hours is not a concept that we have. We go by the, the behavior of all the environment around us. So like if animals start to retire, that's when we know, okay, so it's this point of the day. So we should really be focusing on this, or we should be gathering this supply, or we should be heading back to the camp. The rhythms of the earth 
That's a, that's a really great phrase, by the way. I love that. It's paying attention to all those vital and beautiful connections between nature and the heavens and the knowledge that my people have of it and the love of it. This podcast was produced by OpenSight Ed in collaboration with Furnace FPS. Production of this podcast was made possible by funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation.